In this video, we're going to talk about simple harmonic motion and how pendulums are almost simple harmonic oscillators. They actually, in truth, are not precisely simple harmonic oscillators, but we can assume that they are for small oscillations, small angles of theta. So we already talked about springs, and we talked about how the period of the spring is directly proportional to the mass that's on the end of the spring and to the inversely proportional to the spring constant. Well, now let's take a look at pendulums and what matters for a pendulum. So here we have a nice pendulum and our mass on the end has one kilogram of mass. So we set it into motion and we stop it after one revolution. We see that we've got a period of about, oh it's still going up, about 2.3. All right. So does the change in mass affect how this works. Let's see. We'll go back and we can change the mass here. Let's double it. Now it's two kilograms. So is this going to affect the period of the pendulum? Let's take a look. Swings out, back, oh, about 2.3 again. Looks like changing the mass doesn't have any effect. Let's try 10 kilograms, dramatically increasing the mass. And again, we don't see any change in the pendulum's motion. 2.3 seconds for the period. So the mass doesn't matter for the pendulum like it did for the spring. What does matter? Let's try changing the length of the pendulum. So now we've got a pendulum almost twice as long. We play it. And we see we've got a period now of almost three seconds. If we decrease the length of our string, then we can see a corresponding decrease in the period. And we can see that it goes quite a bit faster, not even two seconds here for the period of the motion. Okay, so the length of the string apparently definitely matters. Let's try something else. Ooh, I don't want to do that. Let's try changing gravity. And we can do that on this program. We go up here to world. And we're going to go, well, first let's look at the period. I changed the length of the, spring, of the string again. So let's look at the period here. We've got a period of about two and a half seconds. So stop that. Go to world. Gravity. Let's change it to the moon's gravity. Negative 1.6 meters per second squared. Is this going to have an effect? I think you can already guess. Moon's gravity. We have... That didn't seem right. Let's try that again. World, gravity, moon, OK. Oh, yeah, that seems right. The moon's got one sixth of Earth's gravity, and we've got a much longer period of oscillation. OK, so we can see that what matters for the pendulum is not the mass of the pendulum bob hanging on the end, it's the length of the string, and it's the acceleration due to gravity. So then we see that the period of our pendulum is directly proportional to L. If we increase the length of the, the string, then we get an increase in the period. And it is inversely proportional to G. If we decrease G, then we get an increase in the period. So our equation for the period of a pendulum is going to be the square root of L over G. And just like we had to do for the springs, we're going to have to multiply that by 2 pi to take into account that a period is the amount of time for one revolution, not the amount of time for one rotation or two pi radians. So we multiply by two pi to take care of that. All right, so the period is the amount of time for one complete cycle of the pendulum. And since we know that period is equal to one over the frequency, we can say then that the frequency for a pendulum is going to be two pi times the square root of g over l. And whoops, we've got to flip everything. 1 over 2 pi times the square root of g over l. All right, so if we know the length of the pendulum and we assume it's on Earth, we know g, then we can find the period. We can find the frequency. Um, we're not going to worry too much about an equation of motion like we did for the mass on the end of a spring, uh, because we can talk about the x motion and the y motion. Really. We're just going to use conservation of energy to solve problems for the pendulum's motion. So if we start here with an angle of theta, then we've got all gravitational potential up here. We can say UG 
at the amplitude. So this is the maximum theta for the swing of the pendulum. UG at the amplitude is equal to the total energy of the pendulum. Because when it's at its amplitude, it has no kinetic energy. It's all gravitational potential. And then when the pendulum swings down to the bottom, down here, it's got all kinetic energy. This would be V max. And we could say that the kinetic energy at the bottom of the swing is also equal to the total energy. And we already know that the gravitational potential of the pendulum at the top of the swing is equal to the kinetic energy at the bottom of the swing. And we know that the total energy of the pendulum at any time, u plus k, is going to equal the total. So we use conservation of energy to solve motion problems for the pendulum. Now, it's also worth remembering the relationship between L and theta here. So if we look at the pendulum when it's at its maximum height, and we want to know what is that height and how does it relate to L and theta, then we've got a right triangle here. And this side of the right triangle, the green side I'm drawing in right here, is going to be L minus H. And so when we relate these, we've got a right triangle, we've got the hypotenuse and the side adjacent. So we're looking at a cosine. Cosine of theta is the side adjacent, L minus H, over the hypotenuse, L. So there's a relationship between theta and L and H when we want to use energy to solve for things like theta. Now, lastly, as I said, a pendulum is not pure simple harmonic motion. It is not identical to a mass oscillating on a spring. Um, and the reason for that uh, goes beyond the scope of this class. But if we have small angles of theta, that theta would be the maximum angle of displacement here. For small angles, then the sine of theta is really close to theta. And this is the reason that we can approximate this as simple harmonic motion. If we move our pendulum way the heck out and theta is 90 degrees, then all bets are off. And we can see what that would look like here. If I take this guy and move him all the way up here and set him go, this is not simple harmonic motion. It does not follow a nice sinusoidal curve. Uh, so we couldn't use the equations of simple harmonic motion to find the period, to find the frequency. Uh, but suffice it to say, we're going to assume anytime we're dealing with a pendulum, we're dealing with small initial displacements like that right there. Any theta less than about one radian will give us approximate simple harmonic motion. But they love to ask that question on a test. Which of these is not an example of simple harmonic motion? And they'll have a pendulum in there, and the pendulum is the answer, because it is not purely simple harmonic motion. It's merely approximate simple harmonic motion. That's it for this one. See you next time.